You want scripture, you want a story. I'll tell you a story and then I'll read scripture. You've been praying for my voice. Some of you have been praying, oh Lord, let his voice run out about three minutes after the last song so we can get to the benediction. The oncologist released me to a regular ENT and I went to the regular ENT Friday for whatever this thing in my throat, my vocal cords were, is, was. Lady looked down Friday and said, it's gone. <laughs> That's after she made me sing up the scale and down the scale. I said, I don't sing. She said, I'm watching your vocal cord. Obviously, you don't. <clears throat> and she kept doing these things, and, and she had the camera in there, if you've ever had to swallow one of those cameras, and she said, well, you know, you're getting older, and I can do vocal cord augmentation. I say, say, what? Yeah, I can augment your vocal cords. I can make them richer and make them, make them join together. I can give you the voice of a 30-year-old. And I said, and how do you do this? Well, you can do it in the office. I'll go down with a needle and inject you, or you can do it in surgery. I said, look. There's a sound system in both worship spaces at Trinity. They have a button called Preacher, 30-year-old voice. They'll push the button. I don't want a 30-year-old voice. Thank you very much. That's my story, but I'm going to get the sound people to give me a 30-year-old voice again <clears throat> without that needle. But thank you for praying because it was your prayers that got me out of this. The only thing they've made me do that I didn't want to do is they said, give up coffee. Three or four cups a day is just normal for me. So I'm down to like one cup every three days. So if you're going to come see me and you want me to be warm and fuzzy, come to see me on Wednesday because that's when I have my coffee. Otherwise, I wouldn't recommend hanging around me, okay? Yes, the staff knows. From the second chapter of Luke's Gospel, we turn the corner on our essential readings of Jesus and we've entered the New Testament. And uh, this is one of the readings you'll read this week from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And he, when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended, and they had started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among the relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. And he said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went, they went down and came up to Nazareth, and he was obedient to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. favor. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. Amen. My son, Andrew, is the comptroller at a Toyota dealership in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which means, I don't know what it means. Andrew pays for everything the dealership does, and he keeps the books, and he does the payroll, and he does all this cool stuff, and he drives a lot of dealer cars. He likes the trucks because he likes to soup up the trucks 
so he can drive around the parking lots of places he goes and get you to look at the cool trucks he's driving, and maybe you'll come into the Toyota dealership and buy a truck. The last truck he had was a truck, it was an off-road truck, and I don't even know how to explain what it had, but it basically had skids along the side of it that you pulled off the side of the truck, you put down in the dirt in case you got stuck. It was a truck that came with its own way of getting you out of a mud hole. It was cool. We played with it for a while. He got rid of it. You see, Andrew, it's just Andrew and Emerson, and when you're a family of two, you can have a cool truck. Last time Andrew came to visit me, pulled up in the driveway in beautiful Gibson, Louisiana, in a brand new blue Toyota Seneca van. Yes, my son who loved those cool trucks is driving a blue van because now Andrew has five in his family. And they all have to be strapped in, locked in, and, and the van's got everything you could imagine. It's got individual television screens, individual Wi-Fi, individual te channels on the television screens so people don't fight. It's got power seats. It's got an ejector seat in the front. You don't, if you call shotgun, you can get blasted out of the van. It's got everything. And I watch Andrew be a dad, and I think, man, dude, things have changed. I grew up 60s style. You remember your mama in the 1960s? This was the most powerful arm ever in the 1960s. Yes, mama would slam on the brakes and immediately this arm would grab who was ever in the front seat to keep them from launching out of the car. You were free range children back in the 60s. The only thing you cared about is your sister was on your side of the car. And the debate was who got to sleep or get up into the back window, that little flat area, and just sun yourself. It was glory. And the, the station wagons, oh, the big old Chevrolet and Oldsmobile station wagons with the seat that faced backwards. Yes, you could give sign languages to the cars behind you. <laughs> and your daddy would wonder, why are they beeping their horn at me? It was great. Air conditioning, roll down the window. Man, we drank from the garden hose. Sometimes we even wait, waited for the water to get cold. Most of the time it was just warm because it had been sunned. We went out early in the morning and came back when the sun went down because our moms and dads knew the parents of the moms and dads we played with. As a matter of fact, our parents knew the grandparents of the people we played with. There was no way you were going to get in trouble and get away with it. Other parents had standing permission to whoop your backside if it became necessary because of the way you were behaving. It was a different time. Parenting was different. We had bicycles and we would, we would move seasons. We would play basketball, we would play football, and then we'd turn around and we would play um, baseball. We were so poor, several of us, that we started playing golf, but we couldn't afford the green fee and the golf balls. So we would go to the country club and find the water holes and dive in the water. And you can take off your shoes and walk in the mud and you can squeeze up a golf ball between your toes and that's how we got golf balls. Can you imagine? No, you can't. You're worried about what was in that water. Snapping turtles water moccasins. We didn't have alligators in North Alabama. We sent them all to Cajun country. But it was different. I pray for parents today raising kids. You know, we'd turn around and say, hey, Bubba, watch this. 
And if you hurt yourself or you did something stupid, three or four of your best friends might witness it. Now you do that and you go viral. And the peer pressure that our, our, our students and our children are under to, uh, to do the things they do, to, to follow the influencers they follow, it, it's just, I can't imagine it. I pray for you and I pray for your children because it's a Herculean task you're accomplishing. And by and large, I believe you're doing it faithfully and you're doing it well and you're to be commended for the love of God in Christ Jesus that you're showing your children. Jesus had a family. We start out our New Testament E100 readings or E Jesus readings with the, the birth narratives, and you, we read those during Advent and Christmas, and we know the story of the angel going to Joseph, and we know the story of the angel going to Mary, and all I'll say about angels is when they say, Fear not, you need to worry because angels don't tell the truth. Because when the angels say, Fear not, you better start worrying because they're about to upend your life. They're telling Joseph, look, nah, she's going to have a baby. Don't worry about it. God did it. And they're telling Mary, you're going to have a baby. Don't worry about it. It's the Holy Spirit doing it. You are going to have a lot of explaining due to your family. Fear not. Shepherds come. Magi come. We flee down to Egypt. We all know those stories. But this story, Jesus is appearing in the temple. He's... The, the family goes from Nazareth to Jerusalem, which is a journey of about 60 miles. They've done it every year. It is their religious pilgrimage. It is what they do as a family. They go to Passover in Jerusalem at the temple. And we've already read in Luke's gospel that Mary and Joseph are raising Jesus as a good Jewish boy. They have had him circumcised on the eighth day. They presented him in the temple as the firstborn male. They've taken him through his bar mitzvah at 12. He will appear as an adult at 30. They are raising Jesus to be a good Jew. They took him to church. The only drug I believe in is I believe in the parents that drug their children to church. I hear people say, well, preacher, where, where are the children? I've been doing this now for 46 years. I have yet to see an eight-year-old drive a car to church. The better question are where are the parents? Where are the parents? Jesus had a family. The family raised Jesus to be a good Jewish boy. They did the Jewish things that parents would do. And as we live our lives, as we model the first family's behavior, we need to raise our children in the love of the Lord Jesus. We need to raise our children among believers. We need to raise our children in church. And you know I love this story because Mary and Joseph lost our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Talk about home alone. If this were to happen today, somebody would call Child Protective Services and say, Theotokos, Mary, the God-bearer, has just lost God. Somebody needs to do something. And I can see Mary as they're going back to Jerusalem looking for Jesus. They've got Jesus' brother, James, hanging out back there in the cart. Mary says to James, Jesus' younger brother, I bet you wouldn't do that, James. You're such a good boy, James. You just, you're, you're older brother, Jesus. What are we going to do with him? Can you imagine the sibling rivalry that went on in that family? According to the New Testament, Jesus had three brothers, and he may have had as many as two sisters. Jesus was raised in a family. In a family. So the other thing that's really neat about this is they do religious things, and then when they look for Jesus, they search for him with great anxiety, and Jesus' response is, huh? 
You should have known I was going to be here. And the RSV translates what Jesus says is, Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? Unfortunately, that is not what the Greek says. The Greek's a little ambivalent right there. It can be translated, Did you not know I should be about my Father's interest or be about my Father's business? A favorite way that I like to translate it, Did you not know that I needed to be among those belonging to my Father? So Jesus was telling Mary and Joseph, it's about time for me to start doing what God has called me to do and created me to do. Jesus had a family. He grew up as a human being with human parents. He had human siblings with all that entails. But there's a model here for our families. It's about being faithful as Christians to our Christian faith. It's about raising our children in church. It's about putting children in places where they can grow and be nurtured and be elevated as Christians. It's about placing them at a time and a place among a people where they can eventually step into their own faith and their faith is going to look different than your faith. Their faith in Jesus is going to look different than your faith in Jesus. Sometimes in staff meetings, for some reason, one of us will pull out a Bible or we'll, we'll be looking at a Bible, and I have a split staff. Some of the staff goes for the Word of God right here. Some of the staff goes for their phone because that's where their Word of God is. It's just the culture that we live in. It's going to be different. Jesus had a fr family. And when Jesus created the church, he created the church to be family. We are brothers and sisters with each other. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are brothers and sisters because God is our Father. You know, the cool thing about Trinity is there are people walking around Trinity that I've pastored before. There's one dude here at Trinity that I've known him before he got here. His mother was on staff at a church where I pastored. His daddy was on staff at a church that I pastored. And his parents were so astute in how to suck up to the senior pastor that that young man was born on my birthday. I mean, that you talk about... Planning, that's planning. And this young man at, at two years old was smarter and had a better vocabulary than I did. And he's now at Louisiana Tech and he's now walking the halls of Trinity. He's probably hiding in the booth right now doing something with technology. And it's been an honor to watch him grow and it's been an honor to connect. There, there are folks here that, that we were together in Natchitoches guitar players on the stage. Now they're roaming around playing guitars and working with students. There's a young man at Tech that he was in the day school in Lake Charles and now he's about to graduate from Tech. I participated with them from a distance. I participated with them up close. I've been a part of their church family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're family. And as family, we support one another, we pray for each other, we encourage one another, we lift each other up when we, we fall. We are there to listen with compassion and faith when one is lost. Jesus had a family and he gave us a family. And he called us to invite others into our family. John Wesley, who had no children, John Wesley, who had no children, said that successful parents at least do these four things, are willing to do these four things with their children. First of all, they're willing to correct their children. Do something wrong in the spirit of love, tell them that parents are willing to instruct their children. Show them how to do it better. That parents are willing to pray for and pray with their children. 
And John Wesley, who had no children, said the fourth thing we need to do with our children, and maybe you had one of these children, we need to persevere. That sometimes being a good parent means you just got to endure it until it's over. And it's over when they move out of the house and off the checking account. Except it's not over and you know that. Jesus had a family. God has given us a family. And he's called us to invite other people into our family. That's sort of what all this activity in Lent is about. It's inviting other people into the family to get to know each other, to have fellowship with each other, to pray with each other, to lift each other up, to share the Lenten journey with each other. It's great to be a part of the Trinity Methodist family because there are multiple generations here. There are people who three generations are all sitting on a pew and that's heartwarming and that's encouraging. And that's how we change the world. Just this week, part of your Trinity family was up here on Thursday night doing a program called Faith and Finances. Faith and Finances is about doing budget and financial stuff. Not Dave Ramsey budget and financial stuff because Dave Ramsey assumes everybody's got five to $10,000. This is faith and finances for people who can't pay their rent. They don't have enough money to go to the laundromat and wash their clothes. This is faith and finances for people who don't have either one, perhaps. And there were Trinity family members who were feeding them, who were allying with them, who were leading the workshops, who were inviting them to join us at Trinity to, to be a part of our family, who were promising them we will walk beside them as they learn some of these basic rudimentary elements of finances. There was another group of Trinity family members who started decorating the gym on uh, Friday to get rid of, ready for the uh, father-daughter dance. What a neat thing for the family to do. The family that dances together stays together. And I watched some of the videos, and dads, some of you got some moves, I'm telling you. We're going to start a male liturgical dance team here at Trinity. I'm going to get you dancing before the Lord. Intensely like David danced going into Jerusalem. But what a neat thing for dads and daughters to get together and just have fellowship. There was another group of Trinity family members who met on Saturday morning to build a ramp for another part of the Trinity family who can no longer navigate without a walker or a wheelchair. And the weather wasn't the best, it wasn't bad. But they showed up and they knocked that ramp out and they had a great time doing it. Because that's what Christians do for brothers and sisters in Christ and that's what Christians do for people who are not brothers and sisters in Christ. They serve. They use their gifts and the graces and their talents to make a difference in people's lives. And then the bravest of all there's a group of Trinity family members who took another group of Trinity family members and friends to Six Flags on Saturday. You want to get close to Jesus? Go with a bunch of adolescents to Six Flags. It'll bring you close to the Lord. I was talking to one of the chaperones on the trip and they said the problem with getting older is you used to go to Six Flags as an adolescent or you went in your 20s and man, those rides were thrilling and you got off the ride and that was great. Now you get off the ride and you go, ouch, that hurt. But they did it. Why? To make a difference. Jesus had a family and out of Luke Two, we can see some models for our family. Jesus gave us a church family 
so we could learn to live in the family of faith, so we could learn to practice our faith and grow our faith and build community and raise our children and grow our church and find the lost lambs and bring them to Christ so we can pray together and love each other and serve with Jesus. Jesus gave us this great family called Trinity Methodist Church to make a difference in lives here in Ruston. Lives of people who one day might join the church. Lives of people who one day might not join the church. But they're going to hear about Jesus Christ because they met this family. If you're looking for a family, we have one for you. But more important, if you're looking for a Savior, we have one. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you've got questions about what that means, or how to do that, or how to join this family of faith, you can find me or Chris or Becky or almost any member of the church. And we'll tell you about it. Thank God we have a family. Would you stand and pray with me? We thank you, God, for our family. We thank you for the families that raised us, the families that named us, the families that taught us about Jesus. We pray, God the Father, that you would make us a holy family of God with our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we might tell the world of his great love. We pray in your name. Amen.